no scope for any second thought about that. It's a crime. Something which is against the state, against the society, against a kind of a violence, violence against nature as to disrupt the natural cycle. Loss of species. Unpardonable. Non recoverable. Let's be very clear about that. So let us not understand an environmental wrong in the normal sense of a tort or a crime, but something which has such kind of an impact where there is no question of recovery. The damage caused is irreversible, that the expression used. When it becomes irreversible, you cannot measure it in terms of money. Please look to the 2006 urban policy document. It refers to certain aspects of nature which are of inestimable value. This is the exact expression used there. Inestimable. You cannot estimate. You cannot reduce it into monetary terms. Once lost, lost forever. The intrinsic value and worth of something which was of immensely beneficial to the quality of life, not just humans, everything around you. Once it is lost, you cannot really recover. It has to be the worst of crimes. It's against nature, it's against life, it's against life cycles, it's against life forms, it's against the sovereign interest of the state. So it should be a crime for the highest order. Can you have a compromise on that? No way. But that is not the question. So we are not onto the crime part. We are getting into the tar part. But can you make such a distinction in the case of environmental issues? And when you talk of, let me, let me just complete the point and come back to it. If you can compartmentalize a wrong into strict compartments of something which is objectionable, tolerable, manageable, okay, we will make it a tort, environmental tort, and something which is non-negotiable, make it a crime. That kind of a hard line can you draw? Can there not be situations? Can there not be situations where something which is having shades of top also has crime written all over and one is inseparable from the other? I can very well understand. If it is a purely a tortious action, inviting imposition of liability, why a corporate entity, why a private corporate entity, it could be any individual, there can be a little bit of a warning, let off, there could be a little bit of a small penalty being imposed, let off, there could be something which is measured in terms of money, Collected like a cleanup cost, polluter based principle. You know that. So, by applying that, the polluter is made to pay the cleanup cost and walk free. That doesn't give you the right to pollute, but for having caused that wrong, you are asked to pay up, pay up so that the status quo ante is restored. But that is at a very marginal level. Not all environmental problems, environmental wrongs, environmental harms, actually some of these scholars would use the expression environmental injuries are of tortious kind. The same activity can be a combination of both a tort and a crime. Why? Right? Even in 
the basic learning of tort law and criminal law you have already learned. A public nuisance is both a target and a crime, isn't it? And environmental wrong is a class of public nuisance. You have to draw linkages from what you have studied in first year in tort law with environmental law. Each law is related to other laws. Only when you do that kind of an exercise of linking one subject with another, learning becomes fun. Otherwise, oh, I finished reading tort law, I won't read it anymore. Let me move to other subject. No way. Law is such an integrated thing that learning of one adds value to the learning of another. That we need to keep in mind. That is the reason why I started with the basic understanding of tort law and criminal law. To take it to the plane of this special law concerning environment. I will just refer to a couple of provisions. As I told you, I will not use PowerPoint, although I have some a, a bus load of material that I have there in my computer to share it with you, but time is not allowing me. So let me just refer to a couple of provisions. There is this provision in Environment Protection Act which says that for a particular kind of any violation there will be a fine that is going to be imposed look at the language used a fine which may be a lakh of rupees up to one lakh that's the expression used, up to one lakh. So the statute itself provides that kind of a bandwidth of fixing how much can be imposed and who has the power, of course the pollution control board. Of course the authority who is enforcing that aspect of the law who will get that discretionary power in deciding whether I should penalize you for 100 rupees or for 1 lakh. But how do you determine that? Unfortunately, there is no yardstick there. But there are certain markers whereby you are going to consider something as an environmental wrong. How do you do that? You do that in case of pollution control. There are what are referred as standards. You fix a standard. There are about seven schedules in the Environment Protection Act, which deals with every kind of a polluting activity, operation, substance, which have a polluting effect. Degrees vary. So based on that, a particular marker, a standard is being fixed. We call it a standard. So, if you exceed that limit, you are on the wrong side of the law. So, accordingly, the authority will decide whether you needed to pay such and such an amount of money, 100, 1000, 10,000, 1 lakh, whatever. And there is also another provision which says that if you repeat the same thing, if it continues for next day like that, on a day by day basis, a certain sum of money can be imposed on you to pay up. But that is not the whole story. Although the expression fine is being used, which is actually a characteristic feature of criminal law of imposition of penal action, it can be since its money is involved, it can be tortious. But the complete story is, it does not stop there. The provision, if you read the entirety, it says, for every wrongdoing under this law may lead to imprisonment, may lead to imprisonment or a fine up to such and such an amount of money or both. 
What do you make of this? How do you class an environment wrong as a tort or as a crime? If it is a mere tort, as you know, compensate them. Pay some amount of money and walk away with a clear heart. But every environmental wrong has this combination. I as an authority, I have the power to decide whether you should be put behind bars or you should be just be imposed with a tarsious compensatory liability of so many hundred rupees. Also the power of imposing both and imprisonment along with this monetary fine. So inbuilt into the statute itself, I am speaking only about tar, I am not getting into crime now, because that is the question. Inbuilt in this body of law itself is this provision, which gives that scope for determination of the amount of money that is payable either to reduce or to escalate, isn't it? But liability is not money. Liability is something that you would invite for a particular kind of a conduct on your part which is objectionable under law, legally prescribed. That's liability. Right? So how do anybody reduce tortious liability? My submission to you, and I want you to do some homework, and I will be happy if you prove me wrong, but till then you have to accept whatever I am going to tell you. As far as Indian law is concerned, the question of reducing tortious liability is not provided in the law. I am not referring to the amount of compensation or amount of relief. Amount of relief, you can work it out. But liability itself, because the standard is fixed, either you are on the right side of the law or on the wrong side of the law, depending on the release of the affluence, the contaminant, which is for which a particular standard is being prescribed, is the floor level. Up to this and no more. That means the pollution control law is not a law for clean air. Let's be clear. It actually is accommodated that every human activity in whatever form that it manifests will have an element of disrupting, affecting the environment adversely. But the environment can absorb that shock, that kind of a tremor. And it's only that which is tolerable we allow, that which is not tolerable which we prescribe by standards, even in case of noise pollution, you have the decibel levels prescribed, right? Up to that you can go and not beyond. And if you go beyond, legal action would visit you. So, you are either in the black or in the white, as far as Indian pollution control legal regime is concerned. There is no bandwidth the fixing of liability. I contrast it with American law, United States. In the United States, there is a scope. There is a scope because the standard is not fixed as in, as in the case of a watertight compartmentalized one that we have in India. What the hell is they give a bandwidth? Zero emission. Tolerable emission. Emission that is permissible. Emission that is objectionable. And allowed with certain corrections. And emissions prohibited and you will be out of business. So, 
those many categories, those many gradations are available in the fixing of standards. If there is zero emissions, incentives are given to you. And a clean industry. Wonderful. You are entitled for a tax holiday. We have more of a punitive regime here and a compensatory regime here. Quite unlike the US system where they give this this elbow space for negotiation. Look, I am an industry. I have this much of ambition. Let's just check. And we'll check in the chart. Oh, this is permissible. Okay, you can go ahead. But supposing you are able to reduce it to zero emissions, you know the kind of benefits you get? Certain subsidies you get. Oh really? Okay. I will try to bring in technology. Any advice? You, the Environment Protection Authority, are going to give me? Yeah, yeah, you introduce that gadget, then this particular industry will only be able to meet that requirement of zero emissions. Okay? That costs money to me, of course, but then the long-term benefits are more because certain subsidies, certain tax holidays, certain benefits I derive, and the government may make available some more land to me at a concessional rate. All these are possible. It is inbuilt into the law in the US system. There the question of relaxation of tortious liability to a public or a private enterprise, no distinction, to an individual or a corporate entity where everyone is available. You only need to be the conform to these markers. And if you can get pigeonholed in this, zero emissions, tolerable, objectionable, punitive, well, you will be treated accordingly. So, even the exercise of discretionary power is a guided discretion, so not an arbitrary thing. Here, even in terms of determining the amount or quantum of relief, the discretion is so vast, the guidelines are not forthcoming. When do I as a pollution control board fix 100 rupees fine? When can I do it for one line? Of course, if you ask the authority, he will tell you that there are manuals. There are certain guidelines that are made available for internal consumption. They are subordinate to subordinate to a subordinate legislation. They are more of administrative instructions rather than legislative prescriptions or even administrative uh, rules or regulations of that kind. There is a little bit of a grey area there. That may be one reason why this question has come. Can there be relaxation of tortious liability for a private corporate entity? Actually, the question is very mischievously worded. I compliment the one who has really come up with this. What do you think about private entity? Why not public enterprise? It actually happened. In the Taj, you know about Taj Mahal, the monument of love? There was a pollution control case in relation to that. And in one of the many cases in relation to that, a decision was made by the highest court of law that in order to save the Taj Mahal from the cancerous polluting effect on that wonderful marble, you needed to move out all those foundries in and around the vicinity of Agra and move it to the neighboring state, something like that. Articles were written by law scholars, including me. How do you discriminate? How do you discriminate between a foundry and a public sector undertaking called as Mathura refineries, which is very close to the Taj and which is the biggest polluter? And why no action on that? Well, the Supreme Court had already given a decision 
the government did not go with any further action on that for the obvious reason that in the expert report that was submitted to the Supreme Court, Madhura refineries did not figure in. Why it did not figure in? Is it not a research institution? Yes, it was. Miri, the Nagpur based organization, one of the foremost research organizations we have. But the problem is it's in public sector. And one public sector will not write anything negative about another public sector. And that's what it hid, that information. So you are making tiny sector liable and a major sector since it is in the public sector. What is social responsibility there? I think it is no way different. Because you are in business, so am I. Even though you are in public sector, <coughs> you are doing business. And you are not performing your sovereign functions like the Pollution Control Authority. So why should there be a discrimination? Anyway, the case is over. The question comes, why should there be a reduction in liability for a private sector enterprise in terms of power? Let me just take you back to 1990s. A situation arose when a group of chemical industries, because I know the afternoon session is very tough to really concentrate, I am telling you a story. In and around Ahmedabad, there were a number of chemical industries. What kind of chemical? Dyeing industry. They were producing the colors for textiles. And you know, this is one of the most polluting substances when they release those from their units and it was directly getting into the Sabarmati river on the banks of which is Gandhiji Sarshu river. <coughs> so there was a public interest litigation there before the High Court, before the bench of the Chief Justice himself, Justice Kirpa. <coughs> With all due respect to the judges I must say here, especially in the higher court level, High Court and Supreme Court, without any exemption. They are experts in constitutional law. And so they relate everything to the constitution. And the people who brought in action in public interest, of course, was referring to the constitution, the writ petition, in public interest. And so you see whether there is any constitutional action possible. You don't look to the minor things that are called the Environment Protection Act violation of the law or anything like that. Very easy to do that. But somehow, they were in the higher plane, no? So when the court was just looking into the answer for this, how do we really handle this issue? <coughs> I am referring to early 1990s. At that time, this idea of standards for every kind of a polluting activity was still evolving in India. And you may be surprised. When the Water Act 1974, Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1974, and Air Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1981, and even Environment Protection Act in 1986, when they came, we had no standards prescribed. We have definition of pollution, we have description of different kinds of pollution, but no standards prescribed. Then, how did the authorities enforce the law? They had certain kinds of administrative guidelines. By and large, they were applying the BIS standards, Bureau of Indian Standards, or ISI, as we call, as we used to call earlier. And you know that BIS or uh, BSI or uh, IS, ISI. are actually meant for something else. The quality of goods, consumer interest, that kind of thing. This is something different. This is in a different street altogether. Because the environment looks to the totality of the entire impact. Not just on the consumer, not just on the quality. From cradle to the grave or from the production process to the disposal stage, these environmental acts kick in, their provisions kick in. 
But anyway, the authorities were enforcing that that way without really having a specific standard prescribed. It only happened starting somewhere around 1984 when they started doing something on vehicle air pollution, something on classifying of industries as most polluting and things like that based upon the kind of effluents discharged from their industry. There were some markers were done. Once again, not a complete and a comprehensive one at all. The schedules, the seven schedules I mentioned came much, much later. Somewhere around 1989, 1991. It's constantly evolving. So, it's at that stage you have the highest court in the state of Gujarat. Looking into this problem, what to do? How to deal with the cumulative polluting impact of a host of industries? <coughs> on the environment, there is bleaching. The agriculture crops are lost. The quality of life of people is affected. The health is a casualty. So the, so the High Court invented a thing. When you don't have <coughs> a clear legal prescription, the higher judiciary has this leeway. They can invent the law. And what they say becomes what happens? Are you listening to me? Are you still with me or have you already started dozing off? Yes, still with you. I said I won't give you a lecture. I'm in conversation with you. Is it interesting? Yes, sir. It becomes law of the land. Yes, somebody said that. So, that is what exactly Justice Kirpal did. <coughs> Before he run, went to the Supreme Court and then Chief Justice of India, he was the Chief Justice in Gujarat. He said, no, <coughs> just because there are no standards, just because the law maker has not thought it fit to fix the quantum of compensation or relief payable for this kind of a damage caused to the environment, the environment need have to be compensated for this wrong. And we are going to lay down this rule. A particular percentage of your annual turnover, each one of these units needed to deposit to the state and the state shall utilize it for cleaning up this river. <coughs> Forget about the reduction of liability, no liability. And luckily the court of law was the savior. Because you know these industries hire the best of lawyers. The lawyers ask this question. Yes, we have released these affluents. <coughs> there is no state of art technology available in setting up the treatment plants in this regard at, at that moment. What to do? Whatever the law says we will do. Law did not say anything, so we have to have. It's free for all. The court applied the polluter based principle. Just because the law did not prescribe in exact terms, the intent of the lawmaker is clear that the polluter cannot go scot free. <coughs> and so we are coming up with a formula. Henceforth, you apply this. So the court legislated, you call it as judicial legislation. Not my words. I think it was uh, Julia Stone who, who used this expression, the first step, judicial legislation. That's what the court was going to do. They laid down a precedent and some of the ratio laid down in that precedent may itself substitute a law. So they don the mantle of a lawmaker. Anyway, we are not onto that exercise, we are trying to answer this question. A very simple question, how complicated it has become now? <coughs> Reduction of liability or tortious liability of a private firm. And courts were exercised over there. No liability at all. So where is the question of reduction here? The court fixed liability. As this lady mentioned, we have polluted enough. 
no question of any concession. And you cannot really escape the clutches of the law. We go by the spirit of the law. We look to Article 21 of the Constitution, right to life. The quality of life of the people is affected. You have violated a fundamental right. And so there has to be a relief. Look at the imaginative way with the court of law was able to anchor a particular decision of it to a constitutional provision <coughs> in the absence of a facilitative mechanism in the relevant legislation. <coughs> Interesting, no? <coughs> So then, uh, people were taking advantage of the law individually or as a corporate entity, public sector or private sector, in <coughs> taking advantage of the looseness of the crafting of the law to escape liability. These laws were meant <coughs> and made for guarding the environment, protecting the environment, Securing it from all kinds of invasions as to affect its intrinsic value, worth and integrity. It may be pollution, it may be degradation, it may be loss or whatever. But some or the other, good lawyers were able to advise these people, good for them, bad for environment, to escape liability. So, question of reduction doesn't come. All the while, the corporate entities, public or private, tiny or built or heavy industry, enjoy this benefit. <coughs> Continue to enjoy. I can give you another example. <coughs> in Assam, in early 90s, <coughs> there was a factory involved in <coughs> Releasing coke into the atmosphere. Coke is an anotropic <coughs> form of carbon. <coughs> Pollution control <coughs> board raised <an> objection <coughs> and brought in an action. It's a long down out affair, but I'm just referring to the gist of it. The matter is before the High Court. The company is asking us, the Pollution Control Board, what's the problem? Why have you dragged this to the court? Very innocent. No? For the release of those undesirable substances into the atmosphere. What is this undesirable substance? Coke. Why it is undesirable? It's polluting. Okay. Which is the law you are applying here? Under which law we come? And you fix liability on us. Forget about reducing tarsus liability. We are asking you the question, under which law we are liable? Oh, why not? Air Prevention and Control of Pollution Act. Oh, what does that prescribe that pollution and all that? Yeah, it does. Okay, let it prescribe. It's not applicable in Assam. Who told you? I am the Pollution Control Board, I am enforcing it upon you. How can you enforce? You have a jurisdiction. Come on. Am I not created under this Pollution Control Regime? Yes, you are. Can I not enforce this law? No, you cannot. Why? You are not authorized. Why? Look at the provision here. When once the law is made, Every state is required to declare either the entire state or any specific part of it as a pollution control area. That notification has not come from the government. And still the law is enforced 
and nobody had raised objection till that time this Mahavir Coke industry, a huge industry, raised objection on a technical count, it escaped. Forget about reduction in liability. Escaping liability, right royally, <laughs> for abdication of responsibility on the part of government is not notified. Although the law was already in force for more than a decade, not that this industry did not know about the law. And if you could dig deep into this case, you know, the Pollution Control Board had actually gone into the industry, told them that you have to introduce these kinds of gadgets, air filter control gadgets, <coughs> so that the pollution level would come down. They had agreed. They had agreed for that. But when it came to the court, the story was different. Legal arguments, no? So, deny liability. I'm just giving you the background as to how and why we are considering that at this particular moment. This particular question. Reduction of liability. So, it is not the question of look to case by case basis. It is not the question of you decide on whether there has to be a concern concession to be given or not. Non-application of law or taking advantage of lacuna in the law. <coughs> that has been our story of the very responsible commercial entrepreneur all around. There were occasions when the courts of law pulled up and they were trying to almost like doing a Houdini act of pulling a rabbit out of a hat, like the magician, coming up with new principles or anything like that. But you cannot expect the courts of law to get involved every time, because when they do that, the administration itself will object and then say, why you are usurping into our administrative terrain? Haven't you heard of that? Jurisdiction grabbing. So many a time the courts will exercise restraint. Oh, let the legislator make up his mind to introduce these provisions, something like that. <clears throat> but why are we discussing the need for the time now? Because sir is already there at 3.15, I should stop. What's the time? 3.15. Can I have five more <clears throat> Because actually I have not come to the real problem at all. This is actually a reason. This is this question has become very urgent and necessary. Let me come to the concluding part, straight up. I am not even started with my first line. But I just gave you a gist. I just placed before you the problem. But now, why are we discussing it? For the precise reason that just last year, the government of India, India introduced, I am just speaking one legislation. An amendment act amending the Biodiversity Act of 2002. <clears throat> and I just pick only one amendment there, proposed amendment. It has not become law as yet, it's still at the draft stage. But consultations all over the country have occurred, several objections have been raised, and I'm only referring to the penal provision there. It refers to one specific provision. I will give you the gist of it. That provision says that for any violation of not taking the permission of accessing a particular resource, biological resource, either by a foreign entity or by an Indian entity without due authorization or not sharing the benefits as is required under the law, something like that, there are several such provisions. Any such conduct is punishable with imprisonment. It is a cognizable offence, non bailable. Cognizable and non bailable. That means it is a crime. You know what a crime is. And this is the crime at the highest level. Why did this provision come? 
This provision comes because our sovereign interest is involved, our resources are going to be taken out of the country without leave, license or permission and it's happening all the while and to cry a halt to that, this stringent provision has been included. The whole industrial lobby and since I have a little bit of an insight into it because I served for one term as a member of the National Biodiversity Authority as the first law expert in that, I can tell you the whole industry and lobby was up in arms against this provision. This is a draconian provision. Scrap it. Now what the government has done, it comes up with an amendment to say that we will remove this penal element in it we will make it a compensatory regime. So, from a crime to a tar. I am not saying that it actually is tantamount to what they say in Hindi, Barakul Maaf. No, not of that kind. But certainly, pay some compensation and carry on with business as usual. It goes to the very root of this law. That is the reason why <coughs> I did tell you at the very beginning itself, can you make a distinction between a particular kind of an offence which is an environmental offence or an environmental wrong into a strict watertight compartment of a targeted a crime. It may have shades of tort, it may have elements of crime. And you have to view it cumulatively. You cannot think of reduction, relaxation or anything. And if at all any relaxation, reduction, it is written in the law itself. Act according to law. Whatever the law provides, you allow. You don't have discretion, but you cannot let one off the hook. But the proposed amendment exactly does that. That's the debate. That's exactly the reason why the question is coming here. Should there be a reduction? or a relaxation in the tortious liability of a private corporate entity. The sequence of events are like this. You start with an objection because the law is stringent and the democrat's head is, uh, sword is over your head. Any time the state may act against you, I become active as an industry. I want to strengthen my defences. What I do, I lobby with the government that it will actually come in the way of ease of doing business. It's a catchphrase. No? Remember what the Prime Minister said in 2014 on the rocky rampart to the Red Force on 15th of August. Ease of doing business. But that is not the complete statement. The statement was you have to take it in the real spirit. He said that we will definitely ease the entire procedure in doing business, provided, provided you make in India, <coughs> sell everywhere with zero defect and zero effect. Zero effect actually means environmental effect. If you can do that, well, this is what is possible. But now our industry is wonderful and some of our lawyers are wonderful people. They pick only the first part of the statement and they say, oh, it comes in the way of ease of doing business. And people who are in the bureaucracy, some of them, immediately really get that idea and prepare a draft which would suit this requirement. So the first step is taken, a draft amendment of transforming a crime into a tort. So lesser status. Be assured, when this amendment takes effect, there will be a further lobby of reduction in the quantum of relief that is to be paid. And the courts have also been supported because <coughs> that when once you have made something as compensatory, I am saying it with complete authority because this is what exactly is happening in the High Court, Supreme Court and even in NGT. You asked Mr. Manoj when he was the <coughs> secretary to the Pollution Control Board. This was something that was said about the waste management regime. 
this was said something about the lake conservation by NGT that looked for a compensatory mechanism whereby the rigor of the penal sanctions are taken care of but the lake becomes clean. So even the court circles, this kind of an idea is coming because lawyers are pushing this idea who are backed by industry to get the concessions they want. I end with one, only one question to you. It's actually a question back to the questioner. The real question is not about whether an environment wrong should remain a tart or a crime, should remain a combination of the two. <coughs> the question is not really about <coughs> making a case for reduction in liability of the tortious kind on a private or a public or an individual entity. Does environment matter to us at all? If you consider that <coughs> we live in a finite environment where there is no question of any replacement or a substitute for it, if you have a policy that you value it as the highest, the question of this reduction and other things won't come. I'll stop with this.